So, <clears throat> Professor Tim, have we got, you can hear him okay? Yes? Nice Get a nod from the back. Beautiful. Good. So, Professor Tim, as I just said, can I just call you Tim? Is that okay? Oh, I prefer it. Prefer it. Uh, as I just stated, you're a, you're a Bernie boy. You went yeah. to Bernie High School. Yeah. No. You didn't? No. You went to Bernie Primary School? Parklands High School. Parklands High School. Bernie State School. Parklands High School. Go to Bernie Parklands. And <laughs> Hellier College. Hellier College. Yeah. Was that like the upper college type thing no, up there? No, it's like, you know, Elizabeth College or Rosney College. You've got to okay. go to somewhere else for year 11 and 12. So you then come down and you do law down here in the early 80s, graduating oh, in 1982. As an 18-year-old, I come to the big metropolis of Hobart. It seems like a joke now, but at the time it was very real. It was a big, was a big, big move. So were you one of those uh, Jane Franklin people? No, you couldn't weren't? afford it. Couldn't afford it? No, no. Oh. The, unit, the, the Commonwealth Government gave me what was called the tertiary education supplement scheme or something, test, 40 bucks a week. And Jane cost more than that. Uh, so I shared a house in Macquarie Street. Not far, just actually the, the old vestry right next door to All Saints Anglican Church down down near the corner of the, uh, where the southern outlet comes in. 40 bucks a week, two bedrooms. She had a bedroom with my cousin. I mean, he really was my cousin. So. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, 10 bucks a week I, I paid in rent. The rest covered the rest of my expenses. Tim, talk about uh, a little bit about your life growing up with your mum. Uh, I've, heard a, I've heard a few stories already about uh, Miss Pat. Yeah, I'm not surprised. She's pretty legendary. Oh, she is very legendary from what I've heard. Uh, yeah, so I'm one of six kids, um, five boys. I was the fourth in chronological order. Uh, and then we finally, well, not we, mum and dad, finally produced a daughter and then hung up the boots, so to speak, to having sort of f finally got what they were longing for. Uh, and, yeah, I had an idyllic childhood on the northwest coast in Burnie. I, I, always, had, I always had people to play with. And, uh, and we used to, my brothers and I, we'd run down Emu Bay Railway Yards to kick the footy after school. We'd run down to West Beach and have a swim. It was just a great, great place to grow up. And, uh, and I grew up in an environment of tremendous love and sacrifice. Uh, always grateful for the fact that my dad, uh, who worked in the big industries in Burnie, spent a fair bit of time at uh, pulp and paper manufacturers first and then short stint at Northwest Acid and he ended up at Tyoxide the rest of his working life and uh, he worked shift work to be able to provide for his, uh, his large family uh, and committed himself really to doing everything he could to encourage us to pursue the things we're interested in and especially to pursue an education and yeah, I'm deeply grateful to him for that. Was God a central figure in, in the household growing up? Yeah, yep, absolutely central. Uh, I grew up in the Brethos, as did Hank Petrusma, and there's probably a few others in the room. Uh, fortunately for us, we were not exclusive Bretho, we were sort of more progressive, uh, and I think that was really important in terms of development of social, uh, social skills. But one of the great things about the Brethren tradition, one of the things I'm deeply grateful for to this day, is uh, the love of the Word of God. So my dad was an elder in our local assembly. We had family devotions around the table every night. Uh, on Sundays, we started off at Sunday school. In fact, Hank's uh, sister used to drive uh, my brothers and I up from our place in Burnie up to church kick off with Sunday school, then 11am uh, worship, home for roast lunch, which was always, uh, yeah, it was always a fantastic meal. I don't know how my mum kept churning that out. And then uh, back for the gospel service at night time. Dad did a lot of lay preaching in brethren assemblies along the northwest coast, so I know the hinterland really well, better than most people. Tewkesbury, Highclere, Stowport, Natone, uh, Priolina. We used to be out there probably once a month and kids always had to go with dad but uh yeah that was really important part of my a foundational part of my introduction to faith so in 1982 you graduated in in 1988 i worked it out i was a 15 year old kid trying to get a kick playing aussie rules and fumbling my way through year nine uh, you were chosen as the inaugural recipient of the 
Golda, Golda Meir Postdoctoral Fellowship to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Mm. Wow. Uh, it wasn't 82 that that scholarship was awarded. It was 19, uh, 1988. But, uh, yeah, I can say a few things about that, Sean, because there was a really important prelude to that, which did happen in 1981, actually. Uh, back in those days, uh, the university newsletter was in hard copy. There's no such thing as a digital, you know, piece of paper. And I can remember one, one week sitting in the law library reading through the, 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 the newspaper, the newsletter, in hard copy and reading this advertisement placed by the Australian Academics for Peace in the Middle East for a study mission to Egypt and Israel over the coming summer. And I was doing a supervised research project, so in our final year in the law degree, it's still something that we offer to our um, first class honours or the students who look likely to graduate with first class honours, a supervised research project. So you work closely with a, an academic colleague and write a 15,000 word paper. I uh, wrote did my... Did you say 15,000 words? I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not 1,500? No, no. Okay. No. Just clearing, that's Extra right. Extra zero. 15,000 word research paper. Uh, and I wrote mine on the um, international legal aspects of the Israel-Arab conflict. So I was already really interested in the Middle East and I saw this advertisement and the advertisement said, study mission has a limited number of places open to senior Australian academics. Wait for the next bit. Got to be sitting down. And their wives. Come on. I mean, there's no way we'd say that now. The offensive. Should have been offensive then, but... I read that and I thought, well, I'm no Australian academic or a wife of one, but mm. I assume from and their wives, there must be, they must be contemplating some people other than senior Australian academics possibly going on the study mission. I wrote off and expressed my interest. Mm. got this um, letter back that said, uh, thanks very much for you know, expressing your interest. Uh, we've only got a limited number of places. We couldn't tell a professor of Middle Eastern Studies at Sydney University they couldn't go on the study mission because a final year law student in Hobart wants to go. But we will keep your interest in mind. A few months later, I got a, another letter, or it might have been a phone call, can't remember, but an invitation to go over to Melbourne for a one-day seminar. Professor Julius Stone, the leading international law expert in the country from Sydney University, was presenting a one-day seminar at uh, Monash University in Melbourne. It was a Sunday because it was run by a Jewish organisation and that's the only day it was going to be, not Saturday, not Shabbat. So I worked out I had a final exam the following morning at 9 o'clock and I checked the airline schedule and I keep asking myself, how did I do that? I, I, you couldn't look it up online. I, I, th I don't know what I did, but I, <laughs> did, we go to, so did we go to a travel agent or did we have a hard copy of the schedule three months in advance or do we have to make a phone call? I don't know what I did, but I worked out that there was the first flight back from Melbourne to Hobart was 6 a.m., arriving in at 7.30. That's enough time to get the exam. I'll go. So I went. And uh, I was a little bit naive. I didn't realise this is my sort of interview to see whether he's, we should take him on the study mission or is he complete numpty or whatever. But <laughs> I rocked up, had a wonderful time, met, um, I met Professor... Um, the, the, yeah, from the, the guy from Sydney, and we had a really nice chat. He said to me, I heard that you're studying international legal aspects of the Middle East conflict. I'm sure there's some things you can teach me. Let's, let's sit down and have a chat. Sat down and, and had a really great conversation together. No condescension. It's a wonderful experience. I was, I was, I was high as a kite, you know. I mean, so excited about all of this. Got up very early the next morning, caught the flight home, went to the exam. They rang me a couple of days later. How did you go with the exam? Oh, yeah, I got there answer the questions. It was all, you know, it seemed to be, be fine. I'm just ringing up to offer you a place on the study mission. Wow. And um, I was so excited and they said to me, we need $1,800 for the airfare. It's amazing to me that it costs the same num number of dollars yeah, yeah. right back then in 1981 to travel to Europe or the Middle East as it does now or sometimes even cheaper now. We need $1,800 in a few weeks, but uh, for the airfare and then, you know, the rest of the costs uh, will be covered by us. There'll be a few extra ones. I had no money. I had no idea what I was going to do. And the next day, 
my dad rings me up from Bernie. He said, I got called in the office today, Tim. Uh, and they said to me, is it true you've got a son uh, studying at the university, David? And he said, yes. Uh, how come you never told us about that and never applied for the funding that we give to our employees to support children in full-time tertiary education? He said, I didn't have any idea that it was available. Well, we pay uh, $200 per term, three-term year, not two semesters back then. $600, we're going to back pay you to Tim's wow. first year. So he said, I've got $2,400 for you. I was pretty excited. Yeah. Um, yeah, not long after that, I had to go and get a, apply to the legal practice course. You had to, back then, you had to do six months legal practice and 12 months articles to be admitted to practice in Tassie. So an 18 month process, it was in that order. The study missions coming back from Egypt and Israel uh, a couple of weeks after the legal practice course starts. So I went and asked for permission to start late. And the person running the course, and I'm, I'm grateful to this day for their narrow-minded bureaucratic approach to things, said, no, you start on the day or you don't start. Mm. So I just walked out of there and said, well, shove your legal practice course because there's, there's no way I'm not going on this study mission, which for me was an opportunity of a lifetime. I'd never been out of sure. Australia. I applied for my first passport. I think I've been to the mainland three or four times. Uh, so it was a really big deal for me and, yeah, a life-changing experience. And the reason why later on, after I'd finished my PhD, uh, I applied for the postdoctoral fellowship and received it and Karen and I went and spent 12 months in Jerusalem. Beautiful. Mm. Welcome, Karen. In 2002, over the 90s, uh, you, you studied mainly on the mainland, teaching in a lot of the universities there. In 2002, you took a phone call that uh, I've seen that you've uh, quoted, changed the tra trajectory of your life. And it, on the other end of the line was a judge who was presiding over the war crimes trial of former Serbian leader Slobodan Milovic. Milosevic. Milosevic. Yeah, yeah. It was quite a remarkable experience. Mm. Uh, yeah, so he, he said to me, um, Judge Patrick Robinson from Jamaica, uh, hello, Professor McCormack, it's Patrick Robinson. And, uh, hello, Judge. Uh, and I thought he was ringing me up to uh, ask for a reference. I had a, I had a couple of former students working at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and I thought he was ringing about one of them. You know, one of them who hadn't asked me whether it was happy for me to be a referee. It happens regularly. It's all, it's no big deal. He says, I'm ringing up to ask you whether you'd accept an appointment as a special advisor to us, uh, my fellow judges and I, three judges on the trial chamber, uh, to advise us on international law aspects of the trial of Milosevic. And I, I was gobsmacked. I, I, when I was a kid growing in Burnie, there used to be a program on telly called the Magic Boomerang. Right. You wouldn't remember it. <laughs> oh, I don't you, know that one. Yeah, it was black and white. You, you're too young for that. Whoever had the Magic Boomerang, when they threw it, time stood still for everything and every person except the throw of the boomerang. And then when they caught it again, it, time started. And I felt like in this phone call, I just chucked the Magic Boomerang because everything stopped. I, th and he, I think he might have said hello, <laughs> and I said to him, "I'm I'm honoured that you would even think of me, Judge." He said, "Don't don't be so modest. We know your work. We want none of us three judges have had um, have any background in the law of armed conflict, law of war, or international criminal law and the prosecution of war crimes. You have that ex expertise, and, and we'd be really really grateful if you." get involved in the trial. So we talked a little bit about what it would mean and I said I've got to get my dean's approval, uh, being then a professor at Melbourne Law School, at the University of Melbourne. Um, but yeah, the, the, I went and saw the dean the next day and he was thrilled to bits. It's fantastic, congratulations. That's a wonderful appointment for you, wonderful for the law school. You have my blessing, go off and, go off and do it. So. Something, as I was reading through some of the case, uh, I read in the case that uh, Slobodan defended himself all the way through the case. Yeah. And there were some terms in there on more than one occasion that it was termed that, that what was put against him was pure evil in what he was doing. How do you 
think to yourself, here I am a Bernie boy sitting alongside a guy who is up for war crimes against a nation effectively that is termed by the world's media of pure evil. Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing to say is that Mr Milosevic was thoroughly human. And that is a very sobering and confrontational thing because he engaged with me, you know, he introduced himself. He knew Malcolm Fraser very well and I'd, I'd done a lot of work with Mr Fraser in Melbourne and I ended up sending messages between the two of them. He had impeccable English, very charming person to speak to and I found it quite confronting to think he doesn't look like he's evil, he doesn't talk like he is, there's no horns coming out of his head or anything that would, you know, you'd be able to then explain what he's alleged to have been responsible for. And that is, I mean, that has made me reflect on the fact that uh, there is within many, many human beings the capability to do absolutely and utterly evil things. So that, that's a first reflection. And the second one, I suppose, is that um, on the, you know, where you've come from and how you hear, I was very conscious that this was an incredible opportunity and I can remember writing out some prayers of commitment about, you know, feeling overwhelmed with the responsibility, not sure whether I'm really up for it or not, but, but just... You know, asking God for him to help me do the best that I could in the circumstances and try and, you know, fulfil the faith that the judge has placed in me. And whatever comes out of it, the experience that comes out of it, then please use that to make me the person you want me to be. So I don't think he... It's not unfaithful in answering prayers like that. Mm. Slobodan uh, died in jail without a verdict, was yeah. actually given. Yeah. And a lot of the media at the time, um, and there was a lot of criticism for the tribunal for failing to get him medical attention at the time. How did you, how did you handle that as being part of the tribunal? It was devastating. Uh, I, I was actually being in Geneva for a few days at a conference run by the International Committee of the Red Cross there. And I flew to the UK because one of my colleagues, good friend of mine, Professor Cheryl Saunders, was uh, on a fellowship at Cambridge University and she and I were working on a, co-editing a book together. So I'd flown to Cambridge, or not flown to Cambridge, flown to Heathrow and got a train up to Cambridge to spend a weekend with Cheryl and her husband. And I got a phone call on, on the Sunday from uh, my former student who was at the tribunal. And he said, mate, the big fella's carked it. And I, I thought he was just, you know, having me on. He'd, he'd had a few, he'd had a few jokes with me over the years about different things the judge was going to ask me to do. And I got into the habit of thinking that you can't take him seriously. So I just laughed at him. He said, "No, no, turn on the BBC right now, and you'll see what I mean." And I did. And of course, the story all over the international media was that Milosevic had died in custody. My plan was to fly out um, that evening. Uh, to Amsterdam and then uh, get to The Hague, which I did. And the next day, I think it was a Monday, or maybe it was a Tuesday, uh, the judges came into the courtroom and held a very, very short hearing where they said that they thanked people for their involvement in the trial. They thanked the defence, uh, not the defence because he defended himself, but they thanked the special advisers who'd been appointed, two others and myself. They thanked the prosecution. They thanked the witnesses and the court staff and they said because the accused has died in custody before the end of the trial, this now ends the proceedings against Mr Milosevic. No capacity for trial in absentia or posthumous, uh, posthumous proceedings. So we just, it was like a two and a half minute hearing. And then we just got up and they walked out of the courtroom. And yeah, it was an incredibly deflating experience because so much time and effort had been invested into the case against him. But I, I guess, you know, in terms of reflections on it, lessons learned, I think the prosecution tried to charge too much. The case against Mr Milosevic was way too big. It wasn't throwing the entire book at him, but he was charged with 66 different counts of combination of war crimes, crimes against humanity and counts of genocide. Uh, and the uh, trial chamber at one point assessed that there were 
in that 66 counts in excess of 7,000 separate allegations of fact, all of which the prosecution had to prove beyond reasonable doubt. So it just it was too much, too much. So let me ask this, Tim, and this is my naive view of the law system, and I'm going to use the word justice, because in reading through, through obviously, the articles afterwards, you know, there was always the things of he got what he deserved, he died lonely and in jail. Was justice served? When I, when I think about that question, I, I think it's worth trying to think about justice for whom? Justice for the individual accused, because it's a, basically a retributive system and we're uh, holding individuals accountable for their alleged um, crimes. In one sense, of course, Mr Milosevic did not receive justice because he escaped a sentence. But it's also... That's a little bit overly simplistic in my view. He was, he was in custody for five years and uh, he was subjected to a trial process and a lot of witnesses appeared against him and the prosecution established much of its case against him. So there was a more limited sense in which he was subjected to a, um, an open, transparent and fair trial process and that's important. Ju what about justice for the victims of the atrocities he's allegedly, he was allegedly responsible for? Some of them would say uh, they felt vindicated just that the case was brought against him, that he was actually transferred to The Hague and subjected to trial proceedings. Many others of them would say they were cheated of justice by not having a verdict of guilty passed against him. But uh, justice for the international community, well, you know, I mean, the prosecution could have done a more efficient job which may have resulted in a verdict being handed down if, if they'd had a smaller case and all would have been finished sooner. But hopefully, well, I'm sure, I know that there have been lessons learned from that trial experience. Around the same time or a few years later, a little bit across further over, in, let's go over into America, uh, you, were, you provided expert counsel for Major Mori in his defence of David Hicks. Mm. Uh, so I guess it would be David Hicks versus a US military commission or, or whoever it yeah, is. The other way around, usually the prosecutor's names first. So okay, so US military United commission States versus David, David Hicks. Hicks. Yeah, yeah. David Hicks, for, for those who don't, aren't aware, I mean, talk about Mr Hicks. I mean, he was, he was a man who, uh, by all accounts, ha had been training with Al-Qaeda. Uh, I mean, that was the allegations for him. Yeah. And that he had um, converted to the Islamic faith. And uh, let me read a quote that he said. This was from David Hicks. He said, My motivation was not a religious search for spirituality. It was more of a search for somewhere to belong. Yeah. You got to know Mr Hicks quite well. Well, not real well, because um, they wouldn't let me into prison in Guantanamo Bay to see him. So my uh, relationship with David, to the extent that it existed, was really through Major Mori. Uh, but I know that he left school when he was... Uh, David left school when he was 15. Uh, he did a number of sort of different jobs, jackarooing up in uh, outback South Australia and in the Northern Territory for a few years. But, yes, he, he apparently was in desperate search of adventure. The first overseas adventure he had was uh, in Kosovo. So there is a link between the Balkans and, mm. and David Hicks, after all. Uh, and he went and trained with the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army, the army of the Kosovar Albanians who are Muslims because of their, the, the, the suffering of persecution by the rest of Serbia and ethnic Serbs in the north of Kosovo. So Kosovo was a province of, of Serbia before its independence. Uh, but, you know, in our overly simplistic approach, that is the West, in terms of how we characterise conflict, it's like there has to be a goodie and there has to be a baddie. The KLA are the goodies because the Serbs are the baddies. So David Hicks training with the KLA wasn't a problem. There was no interest on the part of the Australian authorities for investigating that. Uh, in fact, some of you will remember that we hosted 1,500 Kosovo Albanians out of Brighton, the old army camp before it was finally demolished. So we were sympathetic, uh, Australia and the West, to the Kosovar Albanians. After he trained with the KLA, quite enjoyed his experiences, he went off to Pakistan and uh, there he was exposed to Al-Qaeda. Did some training with them and ended up in Afghanistan 
uh, fighting with the Taliban. And it was in Kandahar in Afghanistan that he went out onto the front line and experienced live fire from the other side, realised actually it's not so much fun to have someone shooting at you, uh, and went back into Kandahar to try and retrieve his passport to get out of the country. And while he was at a bus stop in Kandahar, he was picked up by the Northern Alliance, which was the anti-Taliban alliance that the US allied itself with in its post-9-11 bombing campaign of Afghanistan. And, uh, and the Northern Alliance were being offered bounties by the US authorities to round people up. And you know, I think they got 1,500 US dollars or 2,000 dollars a head. So they got their, they collected their money, handed this bloke over, and along with thousands of others, he was first subjected to some pretty harsh, by all accounts, interrogation on a US Navy ship uh, off the coast of the Persian Gulf, somewhere in re relatively close physical proximity to Afghanistan, and then transferred, along with thousands of detainees, to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, um, hand-picked as a location by the Bush administration because it was not US sovereign territory and the lawyers in the Department of Justice in the US believe that if we stick all these detainees at Guantanamo Bay, they won't be able to rely on the protections of the US Constitution down there in, uh, in Cuba. So are, you, are we allowed to use the word torture? Yeah, we, we ought to. Yeah, absolutely. We should. Um, so I, I, wasn't, I was not physically present, of course. Mm. But I believe that David Hicks was tortured and I believe the US is engaged, was engaged in it systematically. And uh, they But, but, but the, the world, from our naive point of view and when we read the media, we would say, here's a person who's providing material support for terrorism. This was, this was post 9-11. Yep. And you're supporting him. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I was. You were? Yeah. That's right. On the torture front, I would say that the end doesn't justify the means. And the greatest mistake the US made in dealing with its detainees post 9-11 was to throw out its own standards, to reduce its own standards, to engage in torture. And I think it was, we'll come to the, you were, you were, you were supporting him bit in a few minutes, but um, the reality is that the FBI were completely opposed to the use of torture techniques because they, they have to bring a case to the US federal courts. And evidence obtained by torture is inadmissible in the US civilian system. So the FBI thought this is a really, really dumb idea. If we're ever going to try any of these people in federal courts, we're not going to be able to. The case against them is going to be flawed because the evidence that's been extracted for them from them has been extracted by illegal means. CIA, on the other hand, got right into it. And I, I, I can understand that in the environment of wanting to get as much information you can about Al-Qaeda and where they might strike next and doing whatever we can to, um, to prevent the next major terrorist attack, and I'm not trying to suggest that 9-11 was anything other than an outrageous crime against the United States and against the whole of the international community. I'm just not prepared to accept that it's okay to relax the standards of how we treat fellow human beings. And there's a reason why in international law there is an absolute prohibition on torture. Now, on the subject of helping someone who, um, who trained with Al-Qaeda and fought with the Taliban, my view about that, when, when Major Mori first called me, it was in 2004, so by then David Hicks was transferred to Guantanamo Bay in January of 2002. He's picked up in Kandahar in November 2001. So he'd already been in custody for about two and a half years in July 2004 when Major Mori called me. I, I will concede freely, confess even, that in 2002 when I first heard that this Australian had been picked up in Afghanistan, transferred to Guantanamo Bay for fighting with, uh, with the Taliban, I thought he deserved everything he got. What an idiot. But by two and a half years later, when he hadn't even been charged yet mm. and was still in detention, I started, the lawyer in me, started to ask questions about that. How come? Why aren't they charging him? How long are they going to keep him? Is it fair to be 
indefinitely detained without being charged. And so when Major Bori asked me would I help him, would I join his legal team, because he explained to me his experiences were with, with the US Marine Corps as a, as a judge advocate general were prosecuting or defending, you know, what you'd call uh, not <coughs> minor misdemeanours, but but you know, but but basic crimes, um, assault or or sexual uh, sexual assault or theft or fraud or you know those sorts of things. Maybe even a homicide every now and then, where one marine had you know killed a fellow marine or whatever. But he'd never dealt with terrorism cases or alleged war crimes, and he wanted um, people on his defence team who had that expertise, so he asked me. He wanted an Australian. He said, I, w I want someone with a good Aussie accent who can <laughs> do some media in Australia. And so, Tim, let me tie this in, because... As, as um, Jackie Lambie and I, you know, both know, a Bernie accent's a good Aussie accent. <laughs> <laughs> in, in Thoroughly true. I want to tie something in. 2010... Uh, something which is very dear to our church because we've dealt a lot with um, some of the, the, the children who were involved with um, children's armies and, and so forth. We've done a lot of work with some of the guys over there helping with that. Um, in 2010, you were appointed a special advisor when uh, Thomas Lugumbo... Lubanga. Lubanga uh, was convicted um, for conscripting children for the purpose of war crimes. Let me ask this question, because we haven't got a lot of time to go into that so much, but let me ask this. How does a Bernie boy who grew up in, as a brethren, as a Jesus follower, how do you sit there listening to this sort of stuff and, and reconcile your faith understanding these things that are happening there? Yeah, look, the child soldier stuff's harrowing. Kids as young as 10 or 12, abducted from their family, sometimes forced to either execute their parents or see them executed so that those kids know there's nowhere else to go now but the military that they've been recruited into. Complete theft of childhood innocence. Uh, yes, it's harrowing and I guess there's a couple of things that are really important. Um, one is that as believers, as a follower of the Nazarene, I keep reminding myself that I ought not be surprised that the natural state of the world is dark. It's there, right, right through from Genesis all the way through Scripture, that our calling is to shine a light into the darkness and there's plenty of darkness there. And if you leave it to, to the world, it's a, it's a dark reality. But I'm also reminded that the sufficient, about the sufficiency of the atoning death of Christ, which I think is one of the most powerful principles in, in the gospel, that this immaculate life and the willingness to surrender it is sufficient to cover all the sin of all of humanity in its worst, most extreme sources of depravity. That's an incredible thing. And um, I try to remind myself about that, that however appalling and egregious and outrageous this is and however important it is that we hold individuals accountable for it from God's perspective Christ's atoning sacrifice is sufficient to cover all of that That's, there's, there's a lot of hope in that and then of course in terms of God's perfect judgement this is great comfort because Milosevic managed to escape a sentence in the Hague, but, but not in heaven. And there, there's no need for a four-year trial and calling witnesses and the proof of a case beyond reasonable doubt. God just says, what, what's, what's the wow. truth? And how do you respond to that truth? And on the basis of that, off you go, mate. You know, there's no argument. No, Milosevic doesn't have to represent himself there because the truth is laid bare. Mm. And that's true for the people who are held accountable on earth and the ones who escape accountability. And I find that deeply comforting. Tim, something I've admired as I've been doing research on you, I know a lot about you now. No, you, no, you don't really, mate. <laughs> it's, only, it's, it's, it's only the superficial stuff. You want to know, if you really want to know the truth, just right there in the front row, those two people. Yeah. 
They can I'm, tell I you. may have had a phone call or two with them as well, don't worry. <laughs> well, then, then I'm more worried. Tim's, you know, you, you're obviously incredibly well travelled um, and can demand whatever you want in this space. You're back here leading the Faculty of Law here at, at University of Tasmania, and I say thank you for that. I've got a daughter doing law, and I say thank you for that. I say thank you that we have Christian men and women in places of, of you know, in our universities. Uh, I, I pray to see more in our, in our law courts and in our political halls and everywhere there. Some of the other stuff that you do and that you're very proud about and you wanted to make sure that we spoke about it and, and rightly so is that you know, the, the work that you do in serving others as being a director at, at World Vision. You talked about it being a platform where, where you can you know, get out there and serve others in what you're doing and, and hang that, that faith flag up yeah, high. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, on the coming back and, and being thanked, I appreciate that, Sean. I, I'm thrilled to be back. I'm, I've been looking forward to moving back to Tassie for a long time. And, um, and I'm grateful to the university and the selection committee for their expression of faith and in me and the offer of the appointment. And, I'm, yeah, I'm really, really pleased to be back. And part of my prayer is that... Um, God uses me to make contribution here in however he wants to do that. Mm. The World Vision thing is important because at the law school, I am not going to... I'm not going to um, preach to my students or to my colleagues because we have to be an inclusive place. We have to be a, a place... This is true for the university as well as this for the law school. We have to be a place where people from all sorts of different backgrounds and persuasions, who, those who do and those who do not share our worldview, feel safe and included and welcome. So for me, I don't mind that people know that I'm a person of faith, of course, but I also want them to know that they, can be, they will be accepted by me for who they are. So one of the things I like about my involvement with World Vision, I'm grateful for it, is because it's a Christian organisation you don't be appointed a director of World Vision unless you are a person of faith and you're prepared to identify yourself that way. And it's a way that I can nail my faith flag to the mast in a public way. So that's a really good thing. But perhaps even more powerful for me uh, in terms of my involvement with World Vision is, is the work that, that an organisation like that's involved in. And so much of my professional effort is reactive. Law of war, prosecution of war crimes. When we actually get somebody in custody and we hold them criminally accountable, it's, the damage is already done. The atrocities have already been perpetrated. Thousands of people's lives have been ripped apart. And uh, that's not to say it's not important to hold individuals accountable. It, it is. I believe it is. But it's after the fact. And one of the great things about uh, aid and development work, especially some of the um, projects I've had the privilege to witness uh, through World Vision, are proactive about trying to pull people out of poverty, about trying to help communities work effectively together and hopefully in some cases avoid the outbreak of conflict in the first place. And I, I just really wish as an international community we were pouring way more resources and effort into conflict prevention and we were into military power and you know the and, and opportunities to flex that muscle and yeah blow people up beautiful i think uh you'd all agree with me what an incredible 40 minutes we've just had an opportunity to hear the heart uh the emotion of uh of a true tasmanian hero i say and a man of faith that's 40 minutes gone already. Sorry? That's 40 minutes gone already. 40 minutes has gone already. Tragic, mate. We're just getting started. 40 minutes has gone already. Uh, 40 minutes has gone already. I'm going to just... I'm going to end with a quote um, that um, Tim spoke about. This was actually uh, at the legal opening in 2017, I think it was. And I was listening to it. It's a 12-minute piece 
and I encourage you to go online. Uh, it'll be under the cathedrals thing. It's a you know, 2017 opening of the law, law year or whatever they call it there. Yeah. Um, I happened to, to be there, um, happened to, to be this year's one. It's quite an interesting place to go to. I was asked to pray there. And uh, Tim did a 12-minute piece, and he, and he said this. He said, we are indeed blessed to live in a society that is governed by law rather than the vagaries of dictatorial laws or tyrannical rule. And if you actually think about that, it's quite a profound statement. And again, I go back to say, I thank God that we have men of faith and women of faith who are in our law system and in our legal system who are going to uphold the law as it is written and can go home and get on their knees and pray before God, knowing that it's in God's strength, not in their own strength, that they do this. Why don't we give Professor Tim a huge round of applause.